Hey, church family. It's been a crazy year, has it not? I had hoped and prayed and convinced myself that COVID-19 would be in the rearview mirror by now, a distant memory, not. <laughs> so I need to own this one. Uh, I was wrong. I uh, hate to use those words. Why are they so hard to say? I was wrong. Anyway, we've got lots of uh, church family members who are currently sick and in quarantine and pretty miserable right now. So let's keep praying for them. Uh, the church board and the staff, in the interest of safety, it uh, seems to be very uh, rampant right now. We are going to be moving all uh, Sunday services to online. No in-person uh, meetings now for the next couple weeks. We'll uh, let you know uh, for sure this Sunday and the following Sunday, though. And we'll keep monitoring and praying. We'll let you know any updates. Uh, anyway, right now we're about to uh, watch uh, a service. Very same passage I was planning on doing, but we're going to watch this service uh, from Romans chapter 14. Uh, how to avoid ugly, awful arguments with people. And we certainly are living in a day where, uh, if we're not careful, some really ugly stuff can happen between followers of Christ. We need to accept one another. Lord bless you, love you, praying for you. Uh, hope to see you in face to face soon. But in the meantime, I'm praying for you. Please pray for me. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Let's stand together. Come on. Hey.
can say today for real, you're glad to be in the house of God. Those of you who are here this morning. Welcome back to church. If you want to continue, just welcome those who are watching online too. We love you. Would you welcome them as well, guys? A lot of folks watching. Well, we're glad to be here with you today, worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. God, you are glorious, Lord. We, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you would strengthen your people today, Lord, through the word, through the worship, Lord. And um, as we just declare you, Lord, just be enthroned on our praises, Lord. And um, we know that your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people, Lord. So would you come today and just, Lord, fill us up, Lord, again, Lord. Encourage us as a body, as a whole, Lord. Those who are here in this building and those who are other buildings around the campuses, Lord. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for an awesome day today, Lord. Amen. Well, help us out a little bit. Put your hands together. Done great things, amen.
Give him praise and honor this morning. Even when I don't 
don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, come on, try with us Even when Strengthen our faith today, Lord. Fill us all with your spirit this morning. Amen. Ah, can you give the Lord just thanks this morning? Amen. Right now, more than ever, our community needs us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. They need us to be the church. And as a church staff, we've been praying diligently on what we can do to support our community during these times. A few thoughtful and simple ideas have come about and we thought we would share them with you today. Write somebody this week that you haven't seen in a while, or maybe they're in quarantine, or maybe they're sick. Let them know how much you care about them. Another simple idea would be to be a COVID elf. Send a joy bag this week to somebody that needs it. Drop it off on their front porch, send them a text, let them know you care about them and that there's a special gift out on the front porch for them. A few simple ideas would be to be a can of soup, some crackers, and what doesn't make a person feel better than some chocolate. We would encourage you to spread some of Jesus's joy to those around you. You just might be the light that somebody needs to get through this week. Hey kids, today we're going to talk about surviving as a kid. It's tough being a kid, and we're going to go over some basics that you need to know. Get ready! So, if you really want to survive, no. If you want to win at being a kid, 
It just takes knowing and doing the basics. It's not that complicated. And here's the first thing. Are you ready for it? Put God first. Why do you think this is the first thing we're talking about? Because it's important. Even as kids, we should make God a priority. You know, let him know that he's first in our lives. We're all busy, right? With school and homework and chores. We don't have a whole lot of free time left. But instead of just playing video games and sports and hanging out with friends, we should find time to spend with God, too. Let's do an experiment. Here is a bowl. It represents your life. This is a huge candy bar. Pretty big, huh? These are red fish candies, medium sized. These little guys are Skittles. Do you think all of this will fit into this bowl? Let's find out. Let's try pouring the smallest things in first. Now let's put in the medium fish candies. Now, the Kit Kat. Well, that didn't work. Let's try it another way. This time, let's put the big things in first. It fits! Wait a second. I think there's a lesson here. If we put the big things in first, everything will fit right. And in your own life, what could be bigger than God? Our memory verse for today says, Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. That's putting God first. And there are three ways to do that every week. First, pray. That's an easy thing to do every week. Second, read the Bible. You know, like practicing your memory verse every week. Third, talk about it. Talk about God in your classroom and at home. So, Want to survive and win as a kid? Just remember the basics, starting with this. Put God first. Well, I think you can go home now. That was good. <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, that's uh, from our new orange curriculum that our children's ministry team has put together. You'll note there is no kids uh, break off now, there's no nursery, there's no teens. Uh, if you have a child with you, hopefully you grabbed one of the kids' packets. So uh, that will be available every week as, uh, as long as there's no kids' ministries, which is going to be for a little while. Uh, also, did you notice we didn't take an offering plate? No, no offering? Uh, we're not going to be doing that anytime soon. We have boxes uh, at both exits as you come in. Um, many of you made a registration. I want to say thank you. Uh, that's because uh, if you look at last year about this time, about double uh, amount of people were coming that we actually can fit in. So that's why we're going to continue making reservations. If you want to come and be here in person, and uh, thank you again. Uh, only about 180. Uh, as of Tuesday, uh, we were full up. So that's interesting. Um, but if you would continue making reservations, that will help us hopefully distribute people in different services. Uh, we've got some folks meeting right now over in the youth center, and uh, we'll also have the gymnasium there if needed. So we're, we're trying to find ways to make room for everybody. Last announcement, uh, Hope for Kids. Hope for Kids. How many of you sponsor a child? Hope for Kids. Can I see your hands? Yeah, lots of us. That's wonderful. Uh, a child in our sister church in Derryville, Haiti, uh, $32 per month, uh, provides books, lunch every day, tuition, and uniform. And... Uh, the, these folks are some of the poorest of the poor, and yet we, uh, I think last I knew, sponsored almost 100 of uh, those children down in Derryville. A uh, couple things, if you sponsor a child, your annual sponsorship is due June 1st, which is like when? Tomorrow, yeah. So if you could do that sometime soon, 
they'd appreciate it. Also, if you want to see Julie and Jeff Bradford right around the corner there, they have 33 waiting to become sponsored. So if you're able to be a part of that, that would be great. Feels really good to be back with everybody. Preaching for three months to an empty, an empty room, yeah. Yeah. I, I know it feels a little empty and that's intentional, but we're glad you're here. Thanks uh, for coming. Thank you uh, for those who are watching online or over there in the youth center. Uh, it's been quite the three months, it really has. So uh, I'd encourage you, if you'll think about it, uh, why don't you write down now while we're uh, still in the midst of it a bit, at least hopefully coming to the end of it, write down what have you learned? What, what has the Lord been teaching you these last three months? And I would argue that I believe the Lord wants us to learn from the last three months. Sadly, sometimes we go through it and go, whew, I'm through it, and we never took the time to realize what it is the Lord wanted to teach me. So I would encourage you, uh, talk about it, think about it, pray about it, and uh, write it down. Uh, today, as many of us regather, I thought since it's been kind of a crazy several months, controversial, um, corporately, those of you that we gathered here, um, we're going to vote and make some decisions for all of us to make life simpler. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I, I was thinking... Um, we'll discuss and debate some thorny issues, and uh, we're going to have Pastor Bob come up here. He's back from Alabama and looking good. So we're going to decide for everybody how we're going to school our children. What do you think? So we'll, we'll talk it through, you know, and we'll go, uh, first of all, homeschooling. Should everyone be homeschooling? Again, we're going to vote, uh, and then we'll talk about public school being salt and light and uh, charter schools and Christian schools. And after the long debate, how long do you think that'll go on, Pastor Bob? Because once we vote, everybody's got to do it the way the majority decides, right? What do you, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> I think we'll be here months. Uh, then um, we're going to go on to music and talk about the music style that we should all listen to. What do you say? So, so we'll talk through that, you know, what are you, what are you allowed to put on your uh, playlist, your Spotify, iTunes, or, or on your radio? Um, is, is all country acceptable? Or are there certain artists that we're going to say, no, 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 we're not going there? Uh, what about oldies rock, you know? And, and, and then you got to get more specific. Does that mean we could listen to the Stones and the Beatles? Or are they allowed? Uh, and we're just going to keep going. What about rap music? Is that going to be a part of what we allow as we vote together? Uh, what about Christian rap? What, what do you think, Sydney? You know, Lecrae or uh, Andy's cousin, Pastor Andy's cousin, this is true, is NF. Did you know that? So if you want to, anyway, that's just for free. Fun facts to know and tell. Or are we going to say no, only hymns for everybody? And then we're going to vote. We're going to discuss, we're going to debate, uh, and I think Pastor Chad's going to moderate this one, uh, and, and, and we're all going to vote and we're all going to agree we abide by what we all decide, and everybody has to do it, okay? And then we're going to move on to the third issue, okay, here, uh, uh, which Bible translation will we all agree to read, okay? So we're going to ditch all the other translations, uh, will it be the 1611 version of the King James? or one of the revisions, or New King James, or the New American Standard, or the ESV is trending really hot in churches like ours these days, uh, New International Version, and then Bob would say, well, 1974 or 2010 update, which are you going to go with? Uh, and then we're going we're gonna to debate, and then, and then uh, Pastor Chad's going to really... Uh, uh, Step out, and we're going to have Kevin Cleavorn moderate this one because this will be a doozy. What do you think? So I've just not given you a perfect recipe for a banana split. I've actually just given you a recipe for a church split. Do you understand? We, we, we start wrestling on these types of issues and trying to force our opinion and our preferences over these type of issues, we're in trouble. 
because 99% of church fights and splits are over issues like we just talked about, okay? The vast majority of arguing and fighting in churches like Walloon, evangelical churches, are over non-sin issues where the Bible leaves room for a difference of opinion. The Bible leaves room for a difference of conviction, okay? These are real issues, and I, I, I had a whole bunch more, but we don't have enough time. But what's the best school choice for my child? I'll bet you have an opinion, and I would guess many of your opinions aren't the same as the person sitting in the rows in front of you. What's the best musical choices for me and my family? What things are we going to allow and going to be listening to? I suspect different families, you have different opinions, different convictions. What's the best Bible translation? Again, uh, that's going to vary. When my opinion differs from the people around me, track with me, when my opinion dif was different than the people in my small group, the people that I hang with, my, even different than my family, suddenly now you've got uh, all sorts of different ways that can play out. Today, our focus is, what should our attitude be about differences regarding disputable issues? And I just listed three. I could have went into television and movies and, and, and what you believe your conviction is on those different issues, but why does that matter? Why is that important? Because these are the issues that divide families. Do you understand that? These are the kind of issues, that, they're the matters that at times will shred friendships. They're the hot-button issues that over the years have literally split churches on these kind of issues. So today, I want to go back to an old friend of mine. I want to reintroduce you to an old friend. I looked, it was 10 years ago last time we talked about this old friend. So if you have uh, your Bible on your phone, look up Romans chapter 14. It'll be a good friend. It's the most lengthy and helpful section on how to deal with thorny, explosive, controversial issues. Got that? Romans 14, God's plan for his children to avoid ugly arguments. You want to stand with me? You able? Wants to do that. Yeah. We haven't stood and read together for a while. And... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll read God's Word. First eight verses. Here we go. Accept the ones whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord. For they give thanks to God, and whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die... We belong to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of Romans 14. And I believe it is just that, a gift. Because the truth is, Lord, we are a scrappy bunch. Talking about myself. All of us have our own opinions and preferences and ideas. And Lord, a lot of times we want to prove to other people that our opinions and our ideas and our preferences are right and best. Lord, thank you that we don't all have to agree on everything. Thank you, Lord, we don't have to vote 
and all of us have to follow uh, and be yes people. Thank you, Lord, for giving us an instruction manual for life. And you've even given us instructions regarding disputable matters, and we want to say thank you. Help us today to understand exactly what it is you're talking about in Romans 14. Would you, would you help us today? We need your Spirit right now to come and take charge of our hearts and our minds. Lord, we need you to be welcome today in your church. And we want to not just add more facts to our hard drives. The last thing most of us need is more uh, things to add to what we have already on file in our brains. Lord, would you show us how we can put this into practice? We, we want Romans 14 to be something that we begin to live by. So would you help us as we dig into your book? And uh, I pray right now for my friends who are struggling and in pain and suffering and in a hard season. And some of those are watching online right now. Might your word bring, bring peace and comfort. And Lord, some are right here in the building today for the first time in months. Lord, help us to bring encouragement and grace to one another in the church family. And I pray for those watching in the gymnasium as well. Excuse me, in the youth center. Lord, thank you for being here with us. You to come take charge. Might Jesus be lifted high today in his church. And all the church family, those in the youth center, those watching online, those here live, all of us said with one unified voice, you may be seated. It's good to hear an amen. Brant or, or Jason or somebody to holler out amen from the camera, but it just wasn't the same. Roman catacombs, this is where the early church met in Rome. They were not allowed to meet most of the time uh, till much later. Um, the Apostle Paul is writing to followers of Jesus in the church of Rome, Romans 14, consisted of two main groups of people. Okay? First, there were Jews who were saved out of Judaism and they had said yes to Jesus Christ as their Savior and Messiah. They, they brought with them to the church at Rome a Jewish Old Testament law view of life. That makes sense because that's how they would have been raised. Okay, And now they've said yes to Jesus, but they still bring their Jewish roots with them into the church at Rome. So that's the first group. The second group of people in the church at Rome were Gentiles, non-Jews. Some of them were Roman citizens. Most of them were Roman slaves who knew very little about the Old Testament. It was a step further than that. Who cared very little about Judaism or the Old Testament law. You understand? They had come to faith in Jesus straight out of pagan idol worship and the multitudes of little g gods that were worshipped in, in, in Rome. I mean, Rome had all sorts of gods, so they're coming in out of worshipping at these pagan shrines, and now they've said yes to Jesus, okay? So, now you have this very same church at Rome united with pagans and former Jews, and the only thing they have in common was Jesus Christ. That's it. <laughs> the only thing these two groups held in common was faith in Jesus Christ. The potential for misunderstanding and quarreling and really ugly arguments and strife in the church at Rome was huge. And the Apostle Paul knew it, okay? Okay. Apostle Paul knew that, that there was a good chance two groups of people so different, so opposite, it's, there's going to be problems here. Church consultants today, if they looked at this group, if they came in, you know, they'd say, you know what, Jews, you need to form the first church of Rome, Gentiles, uh, former pagans, second church of Rome, that way you guys just don't break out into war, but notice 
the Apostle Paul does not advise the church to split into two churches. He doesn't. Instead, God's Word gives clear instruction about how to get along with fellow followers of Christ, even when you disagree. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, oh, you guys, are ne- this will never work. He says, no, no, I'm going to give you instructions regarding disputable matters. And I'm going to show you how you can get along even when you disagree regarding opinions, regarding preferences, okay? Before we dig in, I want to give you a definition. Um, Verse 1 talks about disputable matters. That's what's on the plate. Except those whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. That's verse 1. So I just want you to see. uh, And what is a disputable matter? You ready? It's a non-sin issue. It's not talking about sin or not sin, non-sin issue where the Bible leaves room for a difference of opinion. Non-sin issue where the Bible leaves room for a difference of conviction. What are you, what are you talking about? Example number one, go back to Romans 14. He gives us a couple examples. Verse 2, one person's faith allows them to eat anything. Another, whose faith is weak, eats only veggies. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. Okay, no freezers, no refrigeration, you understand. That's fairly recent, okay? Uh, At this time... If you uh, butchered an animal, uh, then you quickly would have to do one of two things. Eat the meat or cover it in salt to prevent it from going bad. Covering meat in salt was an expensive process. Most of the time, no one could afford that. So you ate the meat immediately before it went bad. Does that make sense? Okay. So now you have a city filled with idol worshipers in Rome. 68 A.D., approximately, when Paul wrote, there were pagan shrines everywhere, okay? Example of that right up there, okay? So here's the common practice. We're going to offer the sacrifice, the meat, to the pagan idol, and they'll leave it out there for just long enough that now we've done our duty, and then they quickly whisk it off to the local butcher. You tracking with me? So they would, they would sell the meat to the local butcher who would then butcher it down and sell it to the public, and it's a great system. Offer it to the God, little g, wood, uh, stone, uh, whisk it away, get it butchered, and then we can buy cheap meat at at the butcher because this is meat that's been offered to idols. So that's what's going on here. Here's the problem. You got many of these... Uh, Christians in the church at Rome, they'd only been saved a short time. They'd only said yes to Jesus recently, and it wasn't that long ago that they themselves would bring meat to be offered to their little g-god pagan idol. Does it make sense? So they themselves offered meat, and now they're being offered meat that had been offered uh, to an idol first, and they're thinking, I want nothing to do with this meat. Because <laughs> I remember when, when I was involved with that meat, I was also involved with worshiping the, the pagan god that, that I had in my life. I want nothing to do with that meat. And the former Jews were saying, those idols aren't gods. <laughs> they're, they're, they're hunks of wood. They're hunks of stone. There's only one true God, Jesus Christ. Eat the meat, quit being so immature, grow up. That's what the Jews were saying to the Gentiles. It's it's, it's not really a God. Just hunks of wood, eat the meat, and grow up. Example number two. Go back to the text. It's interesting because now the tables get turned. Uh, First was grow up to the former Gentiles. Uh, now it's going to be at the Jews. One person, verse 5, considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day of like. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. 
Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. First example, Gentiles struggling with the Jews' freedom to eat meat that had been offered to idols. Track with me now. Now the Jews are struggling with the Gentiles' freedom not to observe all the feasts and the festivals and the Sabbath. The, the Gentiles are thinking, I'm just living seven days a week strong for Jesus. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm going to live strong for Jesus because in Christ, I'm no longer under the Old Testament law like you Jews. And the Jews are thinking, oh no, you, you have to keep observing the feasts and, and all the holy days and for sure the Sabbath. And look at these these pagans, they're just running and they're, they're working on, on the Sabbath. Who do they think they are? And the Gentiles now are saying, excuse me, I'm living for Jesus. Seven days a week, you Jews need to grow up and quit being so immature. Interesting, isn't it? Both sides are going at it, one, one to one and one to the other. And now I want to give you another example, 2020. Community Church at Walloon, 2020, Community Church in East Jordan in Lansing. Um, We've got people here today who love Jesus with all their heart, who are convinced the coronavirus is an overhyped fraud. And we've got people watching and here today who love Jesus with all their heart, who are saying, excuse me, but... Uh, It's real, and it's dangerous, and over 100,000 people have died. And now I can see right now some of you are saying, but that's not what this expert said. You see the point? (laughs) Uh, We have people who love Jesus who believe that wearing a mask is foolish and doesn't help and is actually harmful at times. And we've got others in the family um, who are convinced that people who don't wear masks are selfish and putting others at risk. Do you see the issue here? We've got people in the church today who are convinced that our governor is a power-hungry dictator who thinks she's our nanny. And we've got others in the church and watching online right now who believe our governor has made hard, painful choices and probably has saved thousands of lives. And here's the challenge. Both sides have their opinions, and both sides are pretty dug in, and we pick and choose our own facts to justify and prove our personal opinions. You understand? Here's my concern. As your pastor of 29 years this week, 29 years, if we're not careful, give me your eyes, if we don't follow Romans 14, God's book here, this pandemic has the potential to be fatal to harmony in the church family. This situation we're all in right now has the potential to divide and destroy unity and oneness in the church family. That's why Romans 14 is critical. We all need to get a handle on this. So we're going to dig back in. I'm going to give you three keys that we need to grab a hold of here in order to maintain harmony and unity and love in the church family. And oh, by the way, they'll know we are Christians. How are they going to know that we're Christians? Size of the steeple, how good our stained glass is, they'll know by how we love one another. It's how we get along with each other. That's the key mark. Yeah, we need to love them, but first of all, they're going to notice how we love or don't love one another. Here we go. First key, verses 3 and 4. I'm going to read it again. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. Okay? Uh, That's the first thought. Um, I'm not going to treat people with contempt who differ with me on their convictions on disputable matters. And uh, another word that's used, verse 4, this is similar. We don't judge each other. We don't treat with contempt those who differ with me on disputable matters, and I don't judge others on non-sin issues. 
We'll throw in uh, where you school your kids. You don't put people down. You don't belittle them. You don't judge them because they've come to different conclusions. Actually, Romans 14 says convictions. They've come to different convictions for what the Lord would have them to do, okay? Follower of Jesus? Who's a follower of Jesus here today? Can I see your hand? Because this applies to you. Um, As followers of Jesus, who do we live for? Tell me. And as followers of Jesus, who will be our ultimate judge? Tell me again. Yeah, yeah. Verse 8, slide down to it. We live to the Lord Jesus. We die to the Lord Jesus. Matter of fact, it says we belong to the Lord Jesus. It's not our job to be the judge of others. Jesus is our judge. Jesus is our master. Jesus is our boss. When it comes to disputable matters, Jesus is the one who we should be looking towards. And I've listed a whole bunch. I'm not even going to list them because just listing them right now, I've realized that that's going to create a little bit of, well, I don't like that one. Oh, that one's mine. Yeah, that. Anyway, I'm not even going to go there. We're called to seek the mind of Jesus. Do you understand? When it comes to disputable matters, we seek what Jesus would have us to do. Our job is to seek out, Lord, what do you want my family and me? What what would you have us to do on non-sin disputable issues? Lord, show me, and then the Lord will show you, okay? Um, Second key, got to keep moving, got to keep moving. Uh, To disarm anger and animosity, to keep unity in the family, Um, no judging, no quarreling, no contempt, and here's what it says, um, live at peace with each other, okay? One person looks at it one way, another person looks at it another. Uh, if we live, we live for Christ, we belong to Christ. Here's, here's the key, live at peace, live at peace with each other, yeah, live, live at peace. Um, our job, verse 19, make every effort to live to do what leads to peace and the mutual edification. Give me your eyes. Our job, do whatever I can to bring peace between myself and brothers or sisters in the church family. Live at peace. Focus, don't tear down, build up mutual edification. It's Christ's job to show us, and then once he showed me what my conviction is on on nonsense issues, then my job is to do that and lead my family. And that's your job, to lead your family. And we don't judge. We don't contempt. We work at living at peace. With, and you've got to work at it. Do everything you can, verse 19 says, to live at peace with one another. And there's one final uh, key here regarding disputable matters. Verse 22, for a long time, this is the one that I ignored and it was to my peril. Verse 22 says this, so whatever you believe about these things, what are the these things? Disputable matters. Whatever you believe about disputable matters, keep between yourself and God. Isn't that interesting? Blessed is the one, God's blessing, who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Do you know what he says? The temptation will be once the Lord has shown you on these different matters, what translation of the Bible, uh, what your movie and TV habits will be, um, where you will send your children to school, what music that you listen to, how you view the pandemic. The temptation is I want to tell everybody my convictions. Go back to verse 22. I think it's very interesting. He says, um, keep between yourself and God whatever you believe, whatever your convictions are regarding disputable issues. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because the Lord knows if we are always talking and arguing and debating on these subjects, guess what? Pretty soon we won't like each other. Pretty soon we'll view each other as enemies. Well, you're on the other side, and the truth is 
we're all on Jesus' side. And, I, and I'm just telling you, it's hard to keep from blasting everybody my views. I feel so strongly my views on music or the president or the governor or, or school, okay? And, and now you're saying, well, they're on my side. We're, we're, we're choosing up teams and suddenly now we're blasting each other on non-sin issues. I love to debate. Ask my bride. I love to argue and joust with words. And I've just learned verse 22 the hard way, can I tell you? I look back with sadness, and before I understood this principle, and I, it, it was ignorance, but that's not an excuse, uh, I just loved. And sometimes I would argue uh, disputable matters, and I didn't even really believe it. I just like to argue and debate. How foolish is that? So I, I, like, vi I like violated verse 22 just for fun and for sport. And now I look back and I've lost friends because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I wanted to tell everybody. I, I wanted to put it on Facebook. I wanted Twitter to know about it. I wanted Insta. I would email. I mean, I wanted everybody to know my opinion was right and I'm going to argue my point to you strongly and I'm going to change your mind. And can I just tell you, almost never, almost never, I won't say never, but almost never, by arguing do you change anybody's mind? Almost never. He's given you a personal conviction on the matter. Keep it personal. Keep it between you and God. Look at verse 22. You'd think I'm, you making this up? No. Just, he says, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. You know, the new amplified Jeff version, shut up about it. Don't blast everybody about your opinions on nonsense issues. It's only creating division and strife and quarreling and arguing. So, let's review. Three keys to avoiding ugly arguments. One, no judging. <laughs> no putting others down, treating them with contempt because they have a different opinion, a different conviction than yours regarding a nonsense issue. Second, verse 19, attempt to live at peace with everybody. Are you going to be able to always live at peace? No. But as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. Build them up. Don't be tearing people down. And finally, quit blabbing about your freedom. Quit talking to everybody about your personal convictions regarding nonsense issues. Keep it between yourself and Jesus Christ. He's the one who gave it to you. Now just keep it between the two of you and, and, and you just march on knowing that Jesus has made himself clear to you regarding disputable matters. Let's pray. Lord, we're living in angry, arguing, quarreling days. <laughs> so we're going to need your help. Would you please protect your church? from division and judging and arguing with one another? Because the truth is, our old sin natures, we are scrappy. <laughs> and we like to think that we're right and they're wrong, but the truth is, Lord, on non-sin issues, it's personal. And you treat us as children, and we want to say thank you. Thank you that there's freedom regarding disputable issues. And Lord, would you help us to do our part, not just to march off and assume everything that's disputable is for us. Would you help us to be wise children and to seek your mind and wait for you to show clearly what you'd have us to do or, or not to do, whatever the case. As we close right now, here, here's my question. How many of you would say, by God's grace, I want to do it according to Romans 14? How many of you would say, you know what? I don't want to just be a hearer today. I want to be a doer. I want to avoid the ugly arguments and the quarreling and the contempt that so often occurs on these disputable matters. 
So Lord, would you help me not to judge? Help me not to quarrel. Help me not to treat others with contempt who have different convictions, different opinions on the non-sin issues. Lord, would you help me to do everything I can to live at peace with the people around me? I want to build my church family up. I don't want to tear them down. They'll know we're Christians by our love. And finally, Lord, would you help us to do what's been the hardest one for me? Would you help us to learn to keep quiet about personal convictions? Put a guard over our mouths. Set a watch over the door to our lips. Put a guard over our social media when it comes to non-sin matters. We love you. We really do. We want to do it your way. So here's my question. Any of you say, you know, that's my desire, Lord. I want to do it your way according to your book. I just want you to see my hand right now. Anybody say, it's my desire to do it your way. Even though it's going to be hard, might have to learn some new tricks. Anybody else? Keep your hand up there. Lord's looking right now. See my hand. It's not a quick up and down, Lord. I mean it. By your grace and strength, you working in me, I want to, I want to start following your instruction manual. Lord, I pray for peace and unity and oneness for your church in Walloon and East Jordan and Lansing. Lord, uh, issues we've been facing these last several weeks, it's a strain. It's a strain not to just blast everybody who has a different view than us. Lord, might they know we're Christians because of our love. And I pray for the church here in Walloon, in East Jordan and Lansing, but I pray for the other evangelical churches in northern Michigan. Pray for our friends at Genesis and Harbor Light, the evangelical church in uh, Petoskey, Emmanuel. Lord, there's, there's lots of churches in the area, and they love you too, and they're battling. I pray for unity and oneness in your church. We ask this all in Jesus' strong name. Did you know we actually have 13 minutes left? It's like that never happens. But we intentionally made it a little shorter than normal. Uh, we recognize we've got some young ones in the service with us. We'll attempt to do that, no promises. So we're going to sing a closing song. We've got plenty of time. I would say if any of you, uh, you need some extra time to get out, not just because you want to be the first at the big boy, but you really need some extra time, um, you can head out during the song if you need to. But after the song, I've asked Pastor Chad to come up. He's got some closing instructions for us. So uh, don't just bug out. Right after the song, Pastor Chad has some closing instructions. And uh, I just want to say one last thing. Um, more than anybody else these last couple weeks, get ready for today. Can I just say... Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of hours have gone into making. It was way easier to shut down to re than reopen. That's just the reality. Um, but Pastor Chad has led the charge. Would you just say thanks, Chad? Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That wasn't even in my notes, Chad, so sorry about that. Let's stand. Let's sing to the Lord. Then we'll have some closing instructions.
sing. You've 